live from Estopan All In. It's the Bamos Morados Podcast, powered by the state of Louisville. Welcome to the Vamos Morados Podcast on the State of Louisville Podcast Network. I am Zach. I am here with my buddy Benton. And Benton, we got some special guests today. We did. We called in some reinforcements. We called in the guys from the Bluegrass Soccer Cast, Jimmy and John. How are you guys doing? Good. I'm good. As John is dying over there. <laughs> I'm all good. I'm good. This is like the the Mega Powers podcast, by the way. Like when we join forces like this, we need to like special branding Mega Podcast. <laughs> merging of the logos or pod. something. <laughs> we both the, cross- the podcast. The crossover episode. Hey, there we go. <laughs> I think I think we've only had four people on at once. Maybe one other time. It was just trying to think about that. Yeah, and I was hard pressed. Usually we just bring on one other guest at a time. But now when we did our like end of season recap Hmm. uh, one time, I think we had four people, but it's usually just maybe us or three people. So it's a special episode. Let's go. Oh, but uh, but but Ben, we don't want to rush into soccer talk. We have plenty of disappointing results to discuss. I think let's uh, let's let's start things off at a happy place. Ben, what are you into this week? Yeah, let's let's procrastinate as much as possible and not get to the actual soccer. But no, um, for uh, I, if you're of a certain age, like roughly like my age, which I think you guys are all kind of within that that ballpark. Do you guys remember Toonami? Yes, uh, vaguely. So I'm uh I'm I'm going back and I'm I'm watching some of the, some of the shows back from from that era, kind of like as comfort watching for me, particularly one I didn't. I, I appreciate it, but I didn't like watch like regularly back then was Yu Yu Hakusho. Mm. The, like the little spirit detective guy. It's just fun fighting. I don't know. It's just pretty like you can tune it on and not much about it. It's just kind of fun. And I just like I just like how some of these like wacky those weird anime stories can get. I'm not really a, a weave or anything, but uh, are you, but I'm now, getting are you, it. I'm are you it. just going back and watching the Toonami shows or are you actually watching like the Toonami episodes because a bunch of them are archived on youtube you can watch like the little in-between sketches with the robot man oh those were so good with uh, what was his best. name is tom tom yeah tom those yeah all... i couldn't remember his name wait tom like, like from facebook because <laughs> they they had different versions of him like i remember yeah. i think specifically he's like tom too he was like the stubby or shorter one mm-hmm. yeah. it feels like know. about once a year he would get a redesign it felt like once a year all the sh- kids channels would like redesign how they did it because like y'all i don't know do y'all remember when cartoon network did like the weird like figurine commercials with all the characters they were like like, almost almost like like a robot chicken thing yeah they're almost like the shape of me's and it was really like a weird niche thing yeah, but I'm I'm not I'm not actually watching it with like the tsunami stuff. That'd be incredible. Maybe I need to queue those up on YouTube between yeah, episodes. Yeah, go on YouTube. You can find a lot of those the interstitials. Yeah, Yu Yu Hakusho is on uh, on Hulu, so I'm I'm watching it there. But I've already thought of a bunch of other shows I, I want to watch. So I've been I've been having a lot of fun uh, rewatching that. The only one I watched with like intense regularity back in the day was was Dragon Ball Z. That was my that was my jam. Dragon Ball Z and Gundam uh, Wing were like my big yeah, yeah. Gundam. That was my big one. Yeah, there's stuff like Gundam Wing I'd watch periodically. Was Cowboy Bebop Hakushu. on Toonami or was that just on Cartoon Network? So that didn't been, I think it was. Like After Dark for some of yeah. that too or something like that? Yeah, that's it was like the Midnight putting, Show. Yeah, yeah, that's when they start putting like the more risque stuff. But, um, you know, like uh, like Roroni Kenshin, just stuff like that. Like I'm I'm ready right. to get back into. And with soccer season going to be winding down here soon, I'm going to have a lot I of worry. free time. We are very head. soon going to have a lot of free time. So uh, head arguably head starting hoped, on Sunday. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go around the horn here. We'll go we'll go counterclockwise. Jimmy, what have you been into? Uh not a whole lot. Actually, uh you all caught me on a special day. Um, it is my birthday today. So oh, happy, happy birthday. Uh, thank you. At least on recording. Uh it's my birthday. So uh had a nice dinner with uh, the wife where I almost died, but you know, it's totally fine. I, I survived. <laughs> um, but yeah. It, it's been uh, a lot of good. 
you know, as far as like different TV shows, I am so behind. Like I haven't even started this season of Wrexham. Um, I haven't even, I mean, I kind of know what happens, right? But like <laughs> we, we got to I live still, it. Right. I still want to see like the behind the scenes stuff. Um oh, gosh, I don't even know if I've been watching anything other than soccer over the last probably month. NFL. Dedication. <laughs> well, you guys I'm... follow you guys follow a lot more diverse soccer than we do. So you got you got a lot more games to keep up with. It's only gonna be crazier in the in the spring. Oh, well, you get a little break in between. Okay, now, uh, we will. John, what have you been into? Anything outside the soccer world capturing your interest? Um outside I'm um, not really. I'm trying to remember what I've watched recently. The issue is is like the writer's strike caused me to not stop watching a lot of stuff because <laughs> nothing was being produced. And so I I would just I watch a lot of random YouTube stuff and I'll honestly like Rhett and Link. Oh, I do that too. I catch oh, I catch facts. myself yeah. on like Rhett and Link rabbit holes. Um I don't know the guy's channel full name. There's this guy named Drew. He does like geography related meme content. Stuff like that. That's about Dude. it. Really. Outside of soccer, but inside of soccer, welcome to Wrexham. And the David Beckham documentary, I've been like moving through that. Is it good? I haven't watched it yet. I've heard good things, but I haven't seen it myself. Real, it's really detailed. So it's four parts, four episodes, but each episode's an hour long. Mm. So it's like like that Michael Jordan one. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's really detailed. It goes into a lot and stuff. Like I just, it's we're in. I'm three-fourths of the way through episode three and he just moved to real madrid so this is may much more like his origin stuff like his build-up they have they focused heavily on like that red card he got in the 98 world cup and all the backlash he got from england for that his redemption free kick against greece like the f- the buzz cut apparently was like a big <laughs> deal, big actually like a really big deal because um, i remember that and stuff I remember and that you being all... a big deal. Well, apparently, Fer... Alex Ferguson is actually like kind of mean, kind of projected as a villain in this because, like, <laughs> well, they like he marries um Tosh Mice and Victor uh, of and like they had a 10 day honeymoon. And on day five, Ferguson calls him and was like, All right, time to come back to training <laughs> of his honeymoon. <laughs> Yep, <laughs> and it's just like a lot of it paints Fergie in a bad way. I think it's just more how Alex Ferguson was as a manager was very controlling that sort of thing, and Beckham was the first kind of star he couldn't control. That world-renowned star. That there was a lot of top managers that are just have a lot of traits like that. That's I think just kind of comes with the territory. Like, but like there level. are a lot of. Bad managers that have those traits and they just get fired way quicker. Yeah, you can you can be a jerk when you win. Bill the, Neville. The, the interesting thing is like how they paint the Real Madrid move because like the president at Real Madrid was like wanting the stars. He wants all those people. He wants these people who are doing modeling ads and have these shoe deals. But like Alex Ferguson is like, if you play for Manchester United, you only wear black boots. You cannot wear any other color <laughs> yeah i heard good things about that i need to add that to my watch list again my calendar's about to open up a lot so i should be able to work that in it's really good and then in particular like victoria's in it a lot too so you like see both sides of it like it's not just david's point of view it's like david victoria some of his dad uh and then like the other reoccurring players are like ryan Giggs so far and phil neville because those are like his closest buddies at Manchester United. I'm curious where it goes now that he's moved in the thing. What's that on? Netflix. Netflix. Zach, what about you? What have you been into this week? I am still all in on spooky season. Mm. I've been continuing my my Halloween movie watch. Uh, we did uh we did our decorations in our front yard. So we have 
we have a very cute light up like ghost LED thing in our window. Uh, and then uh, this week I watched Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one, and uh, the first Evil Dead. And nope, that was because uh, I, I really wanted to see it in theaters, but we had a daughter, so I never got around to it. So we watched Nope this week and it was really good. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't seen any of the movies, but I've heard good things about it. I generally don't do like scary, but you mentioned Evil Dead. I'm like, I need to rewatch Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness. Evil Dead 2 is the so, next movie. So, yeah. I mean, they're all three are good. They're all they're, they're all very different from each other. Uh, well, one and two are like the same thing. It's just like two had a higher well, budget and they made it campier. One and two are like the same plot, but done in completely different styles almost. It, I think it's really interesting seeing like watching, especially if you go straight from watching that first Evil Dead movie to watching like the TV show from a couple years ago, like how different the character got as those movies went on. Cause he's, He's just a dude in that first one. He's he's almost he's he's not even really the main character for the first like half of the movie. And by that third movie, he's like full on Elvis cartoon character. And it's it's interesting seeing the transition he makes in this in those movies. Groovy. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Enough with uh no enough with all the random side talk. Before we, we're still going to continue to pro- procrastinate, though, about actually talking about the matches. Jimmy and John, I want to hear about you guys. Tell our listeners, who are you? And tell us about the Bluegrass um, Soccer Cast. Yeah, so as Benton said, John and I host a, a pretty decent uh, podcast where we dive into all um, professional, semi-professional, collegiate, um, and very little high school and youth um soccer in kentucky so everything from lexington sporting club to loose city racing louisville bowling green uh, football club and even some new uh, teams that are going to semi-professional teams that are coming in um, starting this spring so if you go back to our show on monday which is on our um, youtube and uh, our twitter page um, which both of those handles are at BG Soccer Cast. You'll get some some news on two brand new semi professional teams that are coming uh, to the Commonwealth, one in Louisville and one in a surprise location. I will leave that for our listeners to find out. This is a man who knows how to do a plug properly. <laughs> I think it's the man, best plug I'm, we've ever had anyone give on notes. the show. <laughs> it's because I've listened to so many YouTube and like podcasting <laughs> episodes, and John is like in the like uh, on the stream here, and he's just like shaking his head. He's used to me. <laughs> It literally nope. just takes like, well, no, it might be a decent scroll through the Twitter feed, but like you'll find it if you scroll through our t- the Twitter. Yeah. I try not to post too much on like the day after. So we go live on uh, YouTube and on Twitter. I post too much the day after because then it gets lost, you know, in people's feeds. Um, but yeah, it should be relatively close to the top. What day do you guys do your live show? Uh, good. I should have said that. See, so there are things that I even still am working on in my <laughs> plugs. Um, we go live right now every Monday and Wednesday, but um, spoiler alert, you know, after the seasons are done, we may slow down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Now, what, why did you guys, uh, I, why did you decide to do kind of like a wide like spectrum angle, like of, of looking at soccer across the, the Commonwealth rather than honing in on like on a, on a specific club or a league. I, I, I like the idea of that. I'm just curious the, the origins, because that's a lot of work. I think it's because nobody else was doing it. Right. And like, I knew Lexington was coming in. I knew they were going to be somebody that we wanted to talk about. Um, I had done some previous work on a podcast for uh, the Bolden green golden lions, um, where we just talked about them. And then I kind of just got to a point creatively where I was like, there's only so much I can talk about with one club, especially the semi-professional club. Um, so then uh, our producer and I, we left the, the Golden Lions, went independent, started the show. Uh, we did a handful of episodes, ah, mediocre success, but got things started. Uh, and then we reached out and you know did an open casting call for a co-host. John stepped up and came in. Um, and John, I kind of want to hear, you know, your thoughts on why you decided to join. Um, I decided to join, um, uh, primarily because I love soccer. I love everything about the sport and stuff. And I just, 
wanted to talk about it wanted to get that uh kind of itch out there like i like writing about it and stuff like that and just covering it like like in the beginning when we were trying to ask about non-soccer stuff i literally it's like a tick for me where i just like dive into it like copa 90 has not been good for my health for those who know about like copa 90 stories and they're like hour-long documentaries those aren't good for my health particularly because they've been posting for 10 years so they have so much that i like oh this is from five years ago i've never watched this i'll sit and watch that um but i joined this because i saw they had a thing i was interested i just gave it a shot John is like the brains of everything. Like I can give like the quips, I can give the hot takes and and all that. But John is like the research guy. Like he is the like statistician, uh, especially for Lexington. Yeah, that was I was gonna get into that. So yeah, John, I I know you're you're a Lexington fan. I don't know if you're actually in Lexington proper or not, Jimmy. You're down the Bowling Green area, hence the the ties to that. So what I mean. What what are your guys' origins with soccer? Did you guys like grow up playing? Was this something that you've always just kind of followed from afar? Was it kind of a more like recent times fascination you found? I didn't grow up playing it, particularly because I remember this to this day. I think I was like six or eight and I asked to play it. And I guess one of my mom's cousins played it growing up. And he, I don't know what position he played, but apparently he got such bad leg injuries my mother was like never never for my children um Jesus. i don't know so i i started getting really into sports in middle school which is around 2013 2014 and sports center at the time was like world cup the only thing espn really covers or kind of cares about at the time so i was like all right let me get into this and i got really into it from there and all that type of stuff. Um, and then it was just consuming it. And for me, it's just, especially with how the American schedule is, it was just the fact of it never ends if you follow the world's game. Because, like, America will play through the summer, and then Europe's playing. And then there's, like, if you follow a really good European team, they are playing in four tournaments, at four competitions at once. <laughs> So they're just like, yeah, you might be 10th in the league or like 6th or 8th in the league in my case with Roma, who I support in Italy. But like you're doing really good in the Europa League. So now we have something I can still like keep following with. And it's just it's never ending. You never it's like there's never not something you can look into. So do you have like yeah, a, and- a ton of subscription services you got to follow to get some of these uh these uh well, other matches? Well, really, with soccer, it's really good. There's really two that cover a lot, and that's Paramount Plus and ESPN right. Plus. They'll cover a lot. Yeah, this man doesn't watch Champions League or any of that stuff for some reason. Where's the Europe? I don't want to pay for Paramount so, Plus. Any UEFA competitions on Paramount Plus. No, 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 I did not realize that. That's what I was thinking of specifically so, when I asked that. Mm. Yeah, Champions League, Europa League, um, what is the other? What's the one that West Ham won? The like that, third the one. Conference League one? Yeah, whatever that one. Yeah. Yeah. All those stuff are on there. Uh, I th- the NWSL is on there, obviously. Syria. Um, that's just off the top of my head. And then ESPN Plus covers like USL, obviously, Bundesliga, La Liga. And then Peacock has, I was what I get for Premier League. And then the only league I can't really follow is League One because I think the only way to watch that is like FUBO or whatever it is. I'm no, curious to about... see with the NWSL next season it, exactly how the streaming is going to work with signing like a four way deal. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I've been seeing the talks of that. I was like, that just sounds so confusing. I already get annoyed with like Peacock. Because, like, they'll say you can watch every Premier League game, but except the ones on USA Network. That's what makes me so mad about Paramount Plus with the NWSL games. It's like, <laughs> the ones I need to watch, I feel like, end up being on, on CBS Sports, which is not even a not channel. On Paramount Plus, and then also they're not, like, included in my parents' cable subscription. CBS Sports, and that, that was my issue, um, but the Challenge Cup final. 
it wasn't even technically on CBS. Yeah. It's on this yeah. channel that you can really only access if you go to their website to watch. So they took it off for the thing that like anybody can have on a smart TV and put it on a laptop only service under the basis of, well, that's why there's a noon kickoff. So it can be nationally televised when you <laughs> arguably, in my, my opinion, they made it less accessible. They didn't get any help from the weather. Show. Uh, that whole day was a poop show. So like, hold on. <laughs> now, I'm going to get really, I get really frustrated about this. If that game had been in Seattle, they're going to kick off at 9 a.m. Yes, oh, I think they were going to do last year. Yeah, they always did the finals like that. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. Like, come it's, on. It's well, l- listen. As much as NWSL was weird, they actually did decision day or final match did, day correctly. Awesome. Correctly, they didn't go the route of the championship, which it was like play whenever you want. League One at least semi did close-ish together, but it wasn't. There wasn't that much decision. NWSL went. Chaos. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody kicks off that. at five. Yep. Got to watch seven games all at once to keep up with playoff now, odds. Granted, Although it turns is, out with racing, we only needed to took, watch the one game. But well, no. In all honesty, it took forty-five minutes, and I was like, "Well, <laughs> if that, that game's going not our way, that game's going not our way, this game's going not our way." It. I was like, "Oh, it's all good now." <laughs> uh, Jimmy, what about your your origins of soccer? So, uh, one, I'm old, um, and I'm very much realizing it, especially today. Um, so I remember back the the 99ers, uh, watching that as a kid, uh, watching um, Brianna Scary, uh, um, and, like, leading from the goal. Like, all that was so cool, right? And as a youth, like, I played American football. Like, I was an offensive lineman. Like, I, I didn't play soccer or anything, but... I, I saw the 99 thing, you know, I saw the, the Olympic teams and the runs. And then I remember the world cup in Germany and like USA was supposed to be like really good. And, you know, was watching it on ESPN and ESPN made it this big ordeal. And I was in, I think middle school at that time. And like, I remember one of my, no, I had to been in high school. Yeah. Whatever. Is that 06? Uh, yeah. yeah Germany was, so was six. high school. Yeah. God, I think I was uh, I in was, college that while that work hey, was going on. So oh, I was I go. was in high school. Let's go. I'll just so we all, keep we got quiet. All of... Yeah, he, yeah. I heard Let's you say you, say, you said you were old man for ninety nine. I was like, well, I joined my little <laughs> league soccer league because of the ninety four World Cup. So See? okay, so uh, I'm sure just gonna you. keep quiet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. That's your gift to me on my birthday. Uh, but, but yeah, that's 2006. Cool. Like I remember watching that during class, <laughs> like streaming online. That was yeah. I watched. That's probably streaming that might be 06? the most games of a World Cup I've watched. I don't. Well, I didn't have a lot of. I don't even know if I had internet in 06 at the house. I grew up poor, uh, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I remember watching it on streaming it. Oh my god, <laughs> that would have made me so mad. I don't. John's I know. Like, I never what are you even that. talking about? <laughs> but so, like, oh, that was kind god. of my intro into into soccer. Um, I really got into soccer in college, though. I started my own uh, intramural team, uh, Murray United. We had like a, a sponsorship through. There's a uh, what is that? Like a burrito Mexican restaurant. Uh, in Murray, I went to them. They sponsored us, so we had like their logo on the front of the shirt. We had our crest. We had our names and numbers on the back of the shirts. Like, I, I did went all out, and we had two. Oh, seasons. like we were a terrible. club team. Yeah, like an intramural club. Um, we were terrible though. It was just me and all my friends, but it was fun. I scored in a hey. preseason uh, intramural <laughs> game. It still counts. Think- nice. I don't know if there's I, any. I've scored once in three seasons of our old man league, so I feel you. Let's go. So then, yeah, and then got to the uh, professional years, several years down the road from all of that. Wanted to do a podcast. Bowling Green uh, gave me the opportunity to start and learn, like we were talking about earlier, and 
now we're trying to do this thing independently. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. You guys started earlier this year, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Awesome. Hot fresh, hot and fresh out the kitchen still. Very good. Um, well, before we pivot over and start talking about uh, the little city and racing matches, um, you want to repeat for our listeners where they can find all of your guys' great work at? Absolutely. Um, so all of our shows are on either um, Twitter or YouTube. We also have an Instagram account where we post a lot of content. All three of those have the same tagline uh, or at uh, BG Soccer Cast, all one word. Uh, we do have a website. It is under a little bit of reconstruction uh, right now. We've had some some issues on the back end. We do a lot of writing as well, uh, but those have been kind of put on the back burner for now uh, while we're trying to get our website uh, updated. Uh, but for all of the main stuff right now, just stick to our social media. We also have a Discord. Uh, so let if you're interested and you want to talk soccer, anything in K- Kentucky soccer, uh, join our Discord. Uh, link is at the top of the Twitter page. I will say oh. your guys' Twitter account is super great for uh, keeping up with like all of the college scores. I have uh, ever since I followed you guys, it's been really nice to see all the score updates every for all the for all the games, rather than having to follow everything individually. The D one at least, because if we yeah. you know, if we did every team. <laughs> I would never get off Twitter. For those that don't know, there are 53 collegiate soccer programs <laughs> in the state going Damn. down to Boys College, which is like the NCCAA D2. So, like, yeah. Wait, which, in case we, you we didn't understand. know, that is the we, National Christian Collegiate Athletic Association Division. Division two. two. <laughs> I, I get how that could be a little much. I mean, even just doing the D one stuff on top of the pro and semi pro stuff, like it's just, it's just, a, it's a lot to follow. I follow two teams, and it's a lot. So, so we appreciate all the hard work you guys are doing. It's been, I know I've appreciated following your guys' as, um, work as well, and kind of keeping tabs on some of the other teams playing within the state. So. Now let's we got to rip the band aid and we got to talk about Little City now, don't we? Yeah, we do. So we played the Rowdies last home game of the season. Oh, uh, right. Well, last home game of the regular season. Um, I I think probably last home game of the year. Y- y'all need yeah. some miracles. Yeah, to happen <laughs> if you're we need have another... several <laughs> upsets to happen in the playoffs to tip for their <laughs> other home game. Uh, well, I'm gonna call it last home just game of the one. year. Yeah. Technically, just <laughs> one right now, and you can host. If this week goes good, you can host the next week. Well, my even if we win, though, we still need the lower team to win the other game for us to host. Which you could chalk it up. That's Detroit yeah. versus Pittsburgh. They played again. They tied. So, but that was the end of the thing. So, it could be different. <laughs> uh, Ben, were you in your seat yet when the first game, when the first goal was scored? I unfortunately was. I was unfortunately. <laughs> I was present. not. I was. I was I was getting a drink and turned around to watch the kickoff and turned my back and then heard the heard the goal get scored. Yeah, I was at the watch party for the Lexington game and I get the notification from Fatma kickoff followed instantly by <laughs> goal by Tampa Bay Rallies. I was like, what? <laughs> huh? I didn't even have the game on yet because I was watching some college football. And I was like, oh, <laughs> bet. Let me turn it over. Uh, and we're already down one. Nothing great. Let's go. It I, is I, like I... the. <laughs> it, it is the situation you get in in like our league where a team will pass it back to the last defender on the kickoff and then not really know what else to do and just cough it up and score an easy goal. You do not see teams like Louisville City do that. <laughs> I don't know if you guys play football manager at all, but like if that's the kind of thing where if it happens to a football manager, you just turn off the computer and you walk away. You go touch some grass. You do like literally anything else. I haven't done the research on this yet, but I feel pretty confident saying that was probably the fastest goal that Louisville City has conceded at home. I right actually don't think it is because oh, really? I seem to remember because they did pass it around for like a little bit. It was like the 30, goal. this was like 30 seconds. So, so you're saying there's something quicker. I, I don't it, it was like I there was lucky and lucky Kosana when he played for Penn FC scored the, like Penn had the ball and they lobbed it like they did like one pass back and then lobbed it forward to him on the kickoff and he turned and scored 
and I think it was like 30 seconds. That might have Ooh. been faster. Okay, then we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna have to research. Well, this we'll look afterwards. it up. We'll see if my memory is right. But I know Lucky scored on a kickoff at the very start of the game when he played for Penn. Yeah. So. Since my time, Mike intently following the team, so we'll call, we'll call it 2019 forward. Like I know there hasn't been in anything that quick but okay i'm interested now well, i'm almost way, for like, sure wrong about that so we'll see i don't remember things good it, but i can I, I think i can confidently say though it's the fastest we've we've conceded in lynn family stadium for sure yeah and um you know with the stakes as high as it was that was that was really the the absolute like worst case scenario yeah. ty does not do anything in that game they yeah. needed a win it's like, i don't know watching back the goal like Ball crosses at like the twenty-seven second mark. Oh, yeah, it's under thirty <laughs> seconds. Thanks for fact checking me on that. It made it even worse. <laughs> well, no, I was getting worried looking at the the replay because it was getting in, and they hadn't even put up the scoreboard yet. And I was like, <laughs> "Are they going to score before they even put this score?" The like, it. Don't worry, they're not going to score off the kickoff. We have like a few seconds to put up the score graphic. I, I don't feel like we normally see. Louisville City get get rattled that hard by um, by the press <laughs> like that. Usually, we're the ones doing that. So, for us to not only get get disrupted that badly by it, but then to like concede a goal like that just blew my mind. It was a Sean Tosh pass. Like, like that was like probably the last person I would have guessed too. It just so much about that was weird and unfortunate. It seemed like they well, were just utterly shocked. Like they just like. What are you doing? Like you were not supposed to do this. We did not plan for this at all. Well, you mentioned like the press, right? Like that's been an issue all year. Like going all the way back to uh, who was it? El Paso early in the season, losing three zero at home. Like from that mo- moment on, I kind of realized this is not the same loose city. Like this is not the dominant team that we've expected all year. And there have been some some moments right throughout the season, but. They just can't handle that pressure. And if Memphis comes out with pressure, I don't expect anything different. Well, and like as a defender, you have to have that bell in your head where it's like you look for your pass. And if there's no one to pass to, you got to just like boot it diagonally to to a, to a not dangerous part of the field. Because that's always giving it up on the other side of the field in the corner is better than giving it up right in front of your own goal. Right. Well, it- yeah, that I've been uh, reading the How to Watch Soccer book, mm. and he breaks this down of like the thing he sees. Now, the author is like Dutch. He grew up like in that Around Dutch Ju- system. It's like Red Juliet or something. Yeah, yeah, I read that same book. Yeah, yeah, and he basically says defenders passing back leads to so many goals when they should just. Li-. He's like. This man is very much, of, if you're in trouble as a defender, a keeper, or anything, boot it. There's no reason you should like be trying to build anything. Boot it, because if you fail your build, this is what happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, for conceding as early as they did, I thought then like some of the preceding time was seemingly starting to to go well for for Louisville City early in that match. Like they were controlling the game. Fortunately, got my hopes up. Yeah, unfortunately, like like a lot of the season, they just weren't doing a ton with it. I mean, you know, skipping ahead a little bit, they've got t- 12 total shots, only one one on target. You know, when you have 63 percent of the possession, you know, you're not doing a whole bunch with them. Then ultimately well, it was later in that same half is where they conceded twice more. And that's been kind of how it's gone this season. It, the games where they've had 60 percent possession have been pretty bad across the board the the, mm-hmm. the times that the team has looked good this year they've had less than 50 percent possession because i think yep. they've not been able to execute that like lots of possession build from the back style of play that they've done in years past they've they've been better when they play quick this year and it yeah. almost seemed like at times that when those possession numbers were lower for lucidity that they were actually performing better and they seemed more hungry or something. I don't know the right word for it, but like they seemed like they wanted to score more in those moments than when they were dominating possession. Well, they yeah, were making they were... quick passes and having quick sequences rather than just sort of kicking it around the back and risking oh, yeah. uh, that turnover. Like, like we saw, 
They're very efficient. One thing I like to look at um, in comparison with the uh, possession numbers or where the accurate passes are are happening. So in FOTMOB, they have it broken down by uh, own half and opposition half. And that usually can t- kind of tell a lot of the story. And in a lot of those times when we had the low possession number, it was complemented, however, by having most of our accurate passes were occurring in the opposition's half. And you could kind of see that in the game because, again, when they had the ball, they were doing stuff with it. They were dangerous versus a game like this, you know, almost two thirds of the possession. And it's like, what is it? Um, I mean, they thought a decent amount of the opposition half, but a lot of times it'd be like 50, 50, or maybe even less. It's just a lot of like, you know, not so much danger, but like, kind of like you said, Zach, though, they, they were getting your hopes up because like it, it, it was kind of looking good there for a minute. And then when they pulled even, I was like, okay, like, I mean, it's we're, we're back to level. It's still the first half that felt doable. I mean, you could chalk it up to outside of like five minutes. Yeah. They were arguably the better side the whole game because you get the own goal, they miss that penalty, and then they just get those two real quick. Outside yeah, I mean, of those five minutes, they're honestly the better team from what I saw. Those like, two quick ones, though, that was the that was, that the was demoralizing because it was like the same build up in both of them, yeah. like the almost same the exact, exact same mistake made it midfield twice in a row. It happened to Lex three times this year where they just gave up like two back to back goals, and you just like one okay, whatever. But when you get one within two minutes, it's just like cutting your legs out from under you. You're like done. Yeah, yeah. like well, you're like, just completely demoralized. Tampa's defense has been so good this year that it's like having to having to score three to to come back and get that win just feels completely undoable. Yeah, and the the annoying thing about it is like after the match, and I, you could tell Coach Cruz was, was pretty annoyed. He called out like those like we knew he they were going to do exactly what they did there with those the those two back to back goals. Like they they studied and went over that sequence. And I remember a couple of times now throughout the season. I mean, he's pretty bluntly called out in the press conference. Like we reviewed this, like the team knew this was coming sort of thing. And it's, so it's, it's disappointing that, that they weren't able to, to kind of stop those sequences. And it's to the point where he would, he would call that actively call that out. That it kind of felt it. like, like Jennings and Williams, both for Louisville city, it, they just like physically Louisville city could not handle them. Like it, they would get, players isolated and then take off and people just couldn't catch them uh that it, it seemed like they just could not handle the two of them uh and and part of that is i mean when you when you bring the back line up as far as Louisville city does you are really hanging a defender out to dry to have to make like a incredible athletic one-on-one play and we don't uh we don't have winder anymore to to make any of those miracle athletic recovery runs uh and i think it does it seems like a game like this one is one where you really miss him because he was the kind of player that could make the recovery and catch a guy from behind on some of those plays and and he's just not there anymore yeah i mean i think even having him though i don't know if that that changes the score line you know in that theoretical world um I mean, like, I think it maybe stops one of them. So what about the defender depth, though? Like, that's something that we've kind of seen throughout the season. You know, Winder coming in middle of the season and really, like, giving a boost to the the back line. But that seems to be, like, a massive issue for this team. I mean, Adams was supposed to help with that, and he does a lot, but not with the depth part of that. So what do you all think as far as heading down to Memphis – is the the back line depth going to be another issue for us? I think the big question mark is if Sharpie's healthy or not. Yeah, I think that's is. what really killed them. And He's... the team was looking better for a little bit when they were playing that three back system with with mm-hmm. Sharpie and Adams and Tosh. And but there's <laughs> with the three of them in, there's no one else. <laughs> so everyone has to stay healthy for that. So Sharpie is he's healthy. He was out because of a uh, yellow card accumulation okay. for that match. He was he wasn't missing for injury. Um, but I mean, to your point about the depth, um, I mean, yeah, I think that's a valid concern. You know, your one center back injury to kind of forcing the play, uh, you know, in a one specific way. 
Um, the Jordan Scarlett um, season ending injury er, pretty early on, I think, pretty heavily derailed things. And it's it's hard to pick up a guy, you know, a mid season. So uh, I think it took some time to get Kyle Adams. You know, we knew that Josh was was going to be departing. Um, and I don't know. You have guys like Amadou Dia who could who he could he could flex over theoretically to center back and did a couple of times, but he's out <laughs> essentially the rest of the season. We might you know maybe we see him some point in these uh, in these playoffs, but you know he missed a decent chunk chunk near the end. So I think yeah, I mean there's some some validity there, but it, as long as the guys stay like healthy in the off season, they knew this was going to be an issue and made mm-hmm. a couple moves to address it. And I feel like just sort of got unlucky with. Like one of the players they signed had a season engine ending injury. Um uh uh you know, they they signed like some youth with out of college, kind of expecting to give them give maybe some time to to run up, but with like the injuries, I feel like uh Quam- Ramsey Quamsey had to kind of come in ahead of when probably they would have liked to get him in. Um and then I mean, we knew that Winder was leaving the whole season. Uh, uh, bringing in Adams helped, but it's still just really thin back there. Yeah. I think that that's what really hurts is when you go into an off season and be like, "These are issues. We're going to address that. Bring in players for that." And then either the players you bring in, or if it's like depth thing, and the starters get hurt and injuries happen, and all was like, "Okay, our depth pieces now have to step up." <laughs> <laughs> That that can be an issue is like elite because it could have been worse if they didn't address. Like imagine if they didn't address oh, those issues. It would have been oh, awful. Yeah. It would be an eight seed at best. Unfortunately, we were able to to um, secure um, Kyle Adams. That that was uh, that was a big game changer. But um, for the like weirdest deal ever, like is it's nice to have a loyal, loser back. I guess the fire the sale. Were folding i get i fully understand that but it was really like all right you can have this player and they're going in the playoffs that was a weird thing that i didn't get it was like if they weren't making playoffs whatever it makes sense but they're the fourth seed in the west or something like that so i'm like wouldn't you be like hey we want him for the whole year and playoffs (laughs) not just help us get playoffs and then you can have him for your playoff run are you talking about uh, matiti (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think part of that is, is, you know, they're, they were probably coming close to the to the end of the season. He's a loney. If they didn't see him as like an immediate starter in the picture, I mean, honestly, it could have been a financial decision because, you know, the clubs like folding up shop, are like, look here, we, we can save a little bit here. And at the same time, not really. We don't think hinder our, our team's chances too severely. I mean. Yeah, a lot, a lot of strangeness uh, around that, and I know he was injured for a while. I was surprised that he, that he got back in um in there. I didn't realize he was um, it was it was going to be healthy that that soon. That might have been part of it too. He missed, I mean, he missed a lot of time there. But um, yeah, a lot of a lot of weirdness. But yeah, I mean, to your point though, we actually got to see him back playing for Louisville City again this season, which I I wasn't expecting at all. I had I'd previously seen seen him back in the in the mix at training, but I didn't think he was going to be in action because of those injuries. So, I mean, I thought he was kind of as expected. I'm I'm not personally a fan. I feel like he just dribbles straight at defenders, trying to do fancy moves or take things on on their own. And I don't know. I turned to my teammates pretty early on the season. Like, are we are we over him? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> He's still like he has the talent. Like. The spark is there. He, he can make a great play. Yeah. So I do think I he is a good wild card for the playoffs, but I think he has shown like the consistency has been the issue. Yeah. I, I think if he could lean into being more of a creator sort of role rather than trying to create and, and score on his own, I think that would that would open up a, a ton of doors for him personally because I don't think him trying to be this main main attacker on the wing is working. But if he can if he can try to get around guys to get in a cross or, or get in a nice pass, I think, I, I think there's a lot of potential there, but he's either instructed not to do that or, or doesn't want to do that. Who knows what it is. Um, but I don't know. I'm, I don't, I don't know how to feel about him. I did think it was strange um, having him in the, on the bench rather than I noticed Elijah was, was totally missing thought he could have he's he's usually brings a spark and i wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have been sad to have seen him come on especially kind of in her desperation because later in the match it really just kind of felt like 
We're just trying. The lineup to got weird the... towards the end. I mean, what do, what do you do though? Like I I, th- I was criticizing. Like, man, bench, it feels right? like they're yeah. It's like you're throwing the kitchen sink at him, but it's like yeah. we had three well, strikers I mean, on at one point. <laughs> we needed we Which needed they had never done all year. <laughs> so it's so it was like yeah I, I I get it. It just it just sucks. You know, felt like. It, it already kind of felt lost lost at that point. You know, I was still kind of maintaining hope because I kept thinking back to last season and then the playoffs against Pittsburgh. It was like the 80th minute. We're down to nothing. And I remember just kind of like looking up in the sky. I'm like, this is it. This is where our streak ends. Like we're going to lose to Pittsburgh. End up not happening, but I have I was having, I, I kept thinking like, well, man, we're going to lose to Tampa. Game. I will like, no, say, remember Pittsburgh. The only silver lining um, was that Lancaster goal in the second half. In the 90 second goal. minute or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Very end of the game. He is the kind of player that tends to like get confident and and score in, in bunches. And I do think going into the playoffs, it's good to see at least him hit in, into the playoffs with a very good confidence building goal to, to close yeah. that game out. So that that's the that's that's literally the only positive I can take away from that game is that's a good point. It's been a it's been like a rough season for Lancaster, and so it was very nice to see a quality goal like that from him. And yeah, it, he is a player that really benefits from playing with confidence. So I agree with that one. I stole that from Chris. I was watching the game with Chris when he scored. So is thank you, home? Road Dog. Road Dog. <laughs> so. Ugly loss. Not much. I mean, the one thing I wanted, even if we weren't going to win that match, like I could have, there's, I, there's a world in my head where we don't, we didn't beat Tampa or we, we, you know, we either retired or we lost to them, but we looked good doing it. I I could, there, there was a scenario in which I could have, I could have taken something from that where, okay, you have something good to build off of going into the playoffs. Like that, you know, that would have been a nice consolation prize, but not only did we not win, we lost pretty, pretty damn thoroughly. The, three to two score line honestly feels generous. Like they could have scored more. I think we were fortunate to to score what we did. It was just basically worst case scenario. Yeah. Cause it could have been five one really like that late yeah. goal in garbage time could not have happened, you know, and Tampa had way more chances. Uh, they had the one off the post that missed the yeah. PK. Like they could have been five. Forgot about the PK. Yeah. And how did he miss that? that? <laughs> somebody was smiling down upon us there is nothing <laughs> there's no better feeling in the world than seeing an opposing team player sky a penalty kick yeah it, i'm sure watching an opposing player sky a Philly penalty kick feels better than scoring your own penalty kick i think now um i was i was starting to dig at the numbers so i'm starting to get my like full season like thoughts and stuff together since all the data is already out there for the regular season. And one thing I had to share as soon as I found it, one thing I came across is that that match was the highest expected points that Louisville city has allowed an opponent to earn at home pretty much through 2017. Um, you know, obviously excluding 2020, cause that was a weird statistical anomaly, but like to get, like we were just, we, we really had no business winning or getting anything from that one. And, and, and again, I think it really drives home just how poor that match was. The big number for the season for me is they f- they now finish with a negative three goal differential. And I believe since they've been a team other than like the uh, the COVID year with the short season, their lowest goal differential, I believe, was 21. Um, I thought I heard somebody say 10 plus 10, but either way, I, mean, either I think or, 10 might have been the season. COVID year. OK, because uh, they, they played like. 12 games that season or something. So setting that one aside that regular, like full length seasons, I think it was like 21 or something like that. Lord they're they're like 20 Lord. games off or 20 goals off. That well, yeah. that's, that's an insane thing. If it's that much. Yeah. I mean, they're I like, they I, normally, I, I mean, they're normally averaging close to like a goal plus one goal per game. It, or at least in the 0. 0.8, 0. 0.9, like they they've consistently scored way more than they've given up, and that the, definitely the first year they've ever been negative. Yeah, yeah, I heard the bunch of statistics. Anytime I would watch, it would be like, "This is the lowest amount of goals they've scored at this point in the year, or whatever." 
but I didn't realize like it had the offense had been essentially that good compared comparatively. Yeah. I, I don't want to give too much, uh, too much away. I mean, we'll still do a season recap, um, uh, like record that eventually. And I got the write up, but like looking at like the defense de- de- has decreased, but didn't drop off that much. But the offense, that was, that's where the real problem has, well, has been for the squad. It just well, fell off a cliff. For comparison, we have mostly the same roster as last season. Last season, the goal differential was plus 37. So year over oh year, God. they had a 40 goal swing in goal differential. Last year was like a freakishly good season. Last year and was I didn't really good. I didn't think we were going to hit that same bar again, but like to fall off like that, that I did not expect. 40 either. goals is a big that's swing. A, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. That's rough. <laughs> uh, 2021 was plus 24. Let's see. 2020 is the the COVID year. So, yeah, that one's plus 16, but they only played 16 games. So they were still averaging one, one goal a game. game goal differential. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, not good. <laughs> so with those results, we uh, we are away to Memphis for the playoffs. And Which not feeling... I called for weeks, by the way, I've said for two or three weeks now. Going to book your room in Memphis. It's going to happen. It was, was seeming like, like it because Louisville said he was dropping every opportunity that, that was handed their way. Me- Me- Memphis kept opening the door for him and Louisville City kept not taking it. But uh, but yeah, officially going to Memphis, playing at AutoZone Park. I'm not feeling confident, but at the same time, like anything could happen, you know, like we just, this, you know, all they need to do is start scraping out wins here. But yeah, uh, Memphis themselves had a really bad game on friday night themselves that's why oh, i was that saying was real that. bad memphis kept that. giving them opportunities and then they so kept not being able to capitalize memphis literally handed them all right you want home here it is on a silver platter we got our butts smacked <laughs> purple platter like way way worse than like how Lou city got smacked and Lou city took it and basically their hands were like Transparent and just dropped right through their hands. <laughs> that, that happened. Oh no, more than I'm a ghost. The final weeks, <laughs> or like when you give a kid like a like a big piece of meat or whatever, and they're holding the plate with both hands at the edge, and it just slides right off. <laughs> that's a good one. Oh, that's, that's good really imagery. Good yep. So we are uh, we're not entering this feeling very confident for for pretty obvious reasons, but again, you know. Anything could happen, and if they do go on a run, it will make it all that more special because it's unexpected. But at the same time, I'm not gonna not gonna think too far ahead. I'm not gonna be like looking at uh, you know hotel reservations in Charleston or anything. That'd be their next one, right? If theoretically, no, it would be at no. I think they get right? Pittsburgh. Oh, is it Pittsburgh? Okay, yeah, because they're the four they five, so they'll Detroit. play the one eight. Gotcha. It's Pittsburgh or Detroit. Yeah. So that yeah. that that was the thing. I was like, meant. You all have had favorable in either way. You have favorable away trips, yes. In the sense of Memphis, Pittsburgh, or Detroit as the matchups. Now, to the team's credit, I mean they did play Pittsburgh very well in the regular season both times, and arguably both of those times we could say there was a a, a missed officiating decision that that resulted in Louisville City not getting more from those matches. Um, Honestly, the last feels few like a seasons... long time ago. It, the team would rather play Pittsburgh away than at home. They have been that, terrible against Pittsburgh at Lynn. That home match at Lynn was stupid. Ugh. That was I hated that. so, so terribly. All of bad. them have been stupid. Because <laughs> that was the uh, the one this year was rough. The very first game at the stadium to open the stadium up, they got spanked by Pittsburgh. Three to one. Yep. Yeah. Welcome. Here's your new stadium and take that L. <laughs> so. All right. Well, we need to be uh, wrapping up. We'll go to a commercial break um, bef- and then we'll talk about racing. Before we do that, any any last final thoughts <coughs> on just Lou City in general? No, I want to leave this one behind. Situation? Yeah. I'll leave good. it in the dust. All right. We're going to cut the commercial break. When we get back, talk about racing Louisville. Stay tuned. Does this ever happen to you? 
Do you ever get sick of listening to the same old sports radio? Mount Rushmore this, hot seat that, the same rehashed old musty takes you've been hearing for years. Does it send you into a fit of rage, causing you to lose control of the steering wheel, crashing into a vehicle leading to you being late to a big meeting at work, which leads to your ultimate firing and downward spiral of your life? Does this ever happen to you? Don't send your life into a downward spiral. Do what thousands of others are already doing, listening to the State of Louisville Podcast Network. Louisville football, basketball, women's basketball, baseball, Louisville City and racing Louisville soccer, Louisville culture, and so much more. State of Louisville Podcast Network and stateofluisville.com. Real fans' opinions for real fans like you. Welcome back to the Vamos Bras podcast. I am still Zach. I am still here with Benton. We still have the Bluegrass Soccer Cast boys with us, Jimmy and John. Uh, well, and now we're tough. moving on to racing. Uh, Benton, what happened in the racing game? Was was it was it better than the Louisville City game? Well, they didn't get your hopes up at, at any point in time, either their <laughs> result or the, all their <laughs> results around them. So I give them credit for that, for being just honest from the get go. I was keeping up like as of like 30 minutes into that it was like, or when they, when the, when the Shaw goal went in, I, I checked and I was like, Oh, if they had the lead right now, they would be in a playoff spot. It ended up changing, but, but early in but that it, game, they had the results they needed for just a little bit. But at no point did it look like they even deserved the lead. Like from no, start at to no finish, point did it, it look was, like they were ever going to win that game. Start to finish. It was, it was San Diego's game. It was, it was, Maybe a little bit even more lopsided than than Louisville City versus Tampa, but I mean, like it was San Diego just absolutely controlling things, racing with their backs up against the wall. Racing couldn't um, get out of their own third. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was at the start of that game. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it could have been a lot worse. I mean, just in terms of like how much pressure they had applied the entire match. But yeah, I mean, San Diego got off twenty five shots, ten on target, like pre- pretty brutal stuff right there. Not gonna win a lot of games with when the uh, opposing team has those chances. Yeah, so, I mean, I was trying to go into the match with pretty realistic expectations, knowing we need results from elsewhere as well. So uh, our match wasn't going well. It seemed like for the most part, the other matches that we were keeping a half eye on during our match weren't going well either. So at no point was yeah. like this is happening. This is happening because that wasn't. like I think is a consolation prize. Like even if you flip the score and racing dominate this game, like. Angel City got the win. Uh, OL Rain got the win. Orlando Pride got the win. It was like the other matches did not go racing's way to get them in, anyways. Yeah. So, like, you can go, well, well overall, the game didn't matter at all. Well, <laughs> and it just makes pick. me more mad about the Houston and Chicago games. Because <clears throat> that we had yes. said come in, before Those... coming in the last three games, is like you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you have to get points out of that San Diego game. And if you can win against Houston, winning against Chicago, that's a much better chance to set yourself up. Uh, and they just were not th- those. That was the real missed opportunity. Cause it was, I mean, San Diego won the league. It was always going to be a tall hill to come in and get points out of that San Diego away match. And that's why those, those dropped uh, uh, Houston and Chicago matches. They were really what killed them. Yeah, well, those... especially Chicago. Like that was the one that I was like, you can't lose to one of the worst teams, probably the worst team in the NWSL, and expect to make the playoffs. Like that's when you I kind had of, to get three points out of that. You know, yeah, yeah, like the the one team that had like no shot at playoffs at any real point during this last stretch. Like every other team was still kind of like within striking distance, and you had Chicago, and you get shut out by Chicago. Well, and. Had they, I mean, you go and draw Houston, they're in the playoffs. That that that's where the playoff line was. So those, yeah, yeah. I don't really fault them. Like, it, yeah, that San Diego away was always going to be a, a tall ask. Uh, it was a tall. It was ass. really those other games where they they dug themselves a hole. Tall ass, oh. especially with San Diego still within the hole, they could get first out of the match too so that even made it even rougher because it was like oh san diego could go easy on us if they're like stuck in second they can't move up any which way they could have maybe gone easier like oh we're stuck but no it was like oh we have a shot shot at first okay we're just gonna run right through you we gotta get that dick sporting goods dinner plate 
<laughs> I did think of one consolation prize from that match. Is that the the middle of their pitch towards the um towards like where the uh where the teams were? It wasn't looking super spectacular. No, it didn't. And I yeah. if I was Alex Morgan or Savannah DeMillo, I wouldn't play on such a terrible field. Eat yeah, it, was San real- Diego. Lynn family's a great stadium. <laughs> Eat it. Oh, I'm sorry. You guys had a concert and it tore up your field? Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't. I mean, I don't think either our pitch or their pitch were really that bad, but um, but I'm going to be extra critical. I will, I mean, just because like, they were dicks. Look, they Absolute were being a jerk about it, about it. But I will, I will say, like, we were watching the Houston game, the away game at Houston on TV, and my wife was like, "Why doesn't our grass look as nice as theirs? <laughs> they got they got cool lines cut into it in a checkerboard pattern, and ours never looks like that." I was like, "Yeah, nice grass." <laughs> because they got that MLS funding uh, taking care of that field. <laughs> I would say they got they got the Dynamo paying for the they field. Got, so. They got Apple money. <laughs> Some people need to watch League One and just remember the difference. <laughs> yeah, I'm just happy. I'm just happy that there's not a baseball diamond or football field lines on it. That's <laughs> yep. Listen, listen, boy, those those indie away games where where you've got like three oh sets of out of bounds lines to keep track of. That are, yeah, are that is full to watch. Uh, that is annoying. I indie. When I've watched some college games, you have the like everything is on this field yeah. thing. So they have like the lacrosse lines, they have field hockey lines. Yep. You know what? That's annoying. If it's just football. Because that's what Lex plays on right now. It's okay, um, to me. Because I, do, the one thing I will like about gridiron lines is you can tell distance yeah. a lot easier. True. That's the True. only thing. But outside the, of that, it is ugly. The thing yeah. that kills me, which I, rough on the players, is no matter how long I'm watching the game, my brain never adjusts to the football field out of a bound line, not being the out of bounds yeah. line. Yeah. And so yeah. every time, so- every time they pass it out wide, I'm like, ah, oh, out of bounds. And then they keep playing. I was like, Oh, wrong line. Now, what, one thing that bothers me almost as much as, as football lines are tracks around the field. Cause you feel like you're a million miles away from the pitch itself, especially when you're an Indian, they put us all the way, like way up in the back of the bleachers. Like I almost literally need binoculars to watch a, Oh, matches the away fan there. That stadium at Indy is just terrible. Like it looks bad on TV Dilly. for the college games. It looks even worse for Indy because they, at times they don't feel the stadium very well. But yeah, they're about to have, also they're supposed to have about to have maybe a nicer stadium than some MLS teams coming. I'm excited I mean, for them. I want a good away day. Is that finalized? Like, are they for sure? Oh, doing yeah. It? They're doing that. It's actually happening like, now. When we were up there recently, it looked it's... like they had a bunch of, it looked like they had like a metro, or like a city council meeting, and I think they got the vote. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it was it's like for real happening now. Year. It's going to happen. They're wanting to host like the US team, and they're wanting to bring like other stuff into Indianapolis with the stadium, too. It's not just going to be for Indy 11 football lines for Lex that their stadium also is is starting like they've got all the approvals I think on that so I'm I yeah, really going to get it before Indy because Let's we're go. division three and <laughs> I not cannot building believe how them. fast because they're supposed to play in it next season right uh, August okay so yeah, the last couple that's yeah. still uh, a quick turnaround so they already had to be fair it's a 55,000 seat stadium and a bunch of people are like we're going to be at 100. Georgetown until 2025. I was like, do you understand how easy it is to build like a 5,000 seat stadium? Like truly and honestly, it's just a bunch of stands. <laughs> I just you hope have, it's a big enough press box. I think Cause... that from what I know, they're going to have an away stand. That's literally an away stand. That's just like stands with maybe a con- small concourse. They're going to have two buildings. And then there's going to be the grandstand with all the other stuff. So it's really building one actual stand, buildings with sta- uh, stands in front of them, and then literally just stands. So it's not that complicated. Plus, they've already been laying the foundation and stuff with all the training facilities being I'm sure around it. I'm sure they're keeping expandability in mind too with its design. Yeah, it's the from the press conference. It's fifty five thousand to open is this plan. And it can expand to eleven thousand. That's the ideal. 
So I don't know how it would, if that means enclosing it from the renderings, if that means adding an extra deck to one of the stands. Yeah, but, it's kind of they did the same thing with Lynn, where it's like they they said that it could be expandable, but they didn't really give specific details on where the expansion. They did so would be. the fa- phase one of the expansion would be they would close it. They would close it off so that open end would they would wrap around it and there'd be seats yeah. there. And then the next level beyond that is they would literally raise up and add like an, another um yeah. like a middle deck in between. I think I remember them saying on the sidelines mm-hmm. like they poured the foundation to be able to handle another deck on the sidelines yeah. if they ever were to build it. So theory, I mean, theoretically, close it first, take the sun out of people's eyes. <laughs> oh, you're not bringing back sun talk. I re- refuse. We, 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 we beat that horse. <laughs> uh, speaking of things that are not as uh, beautiful and things that get in the way, right? Uh, let's talk about some of the stats from this racing game. Uh, San Diego dominated in every facet except for possession, which was a little bit closer to 50 50. But shots, shots on target, uh, passes in general, just massively overwhelmingly favoring San Diego. So, not to, to keep kicking uh, racing while they're down, but like it was a full on beat down uh, by San Diego. Well, and like that first goal, like you would say for for the inconsistency and inconsistency and trouble raising his head, like Ersig has been the stalwart, like the consistently good player. And then to give a first that first goal up from a mistake by her, like really, I feel like <laughs> sets the tone in a negative way. Like, Toast for a little not even Ursig can't even count racing. on the most count onable player on the team this game. Weird parallels between our uh, the two matches. Yes. Okay. Indeed, indeed. I don't have anything more to say about the match other than I'm sad that racing did not make the playoffs. Um, I am happy though, however, that it was close. It was like in some ways admirable admirable it's not like they were clearly like knocked out or, or out of the picture but um but they I do did feel like finish with a potential. positive goal differential on the season it won yeah. so the smallest positive goal differential you could, you could have but I, that's like a sign of growth for the team i feel like po- uh, positive goal differential technically in it till the final day build the type of thing day. Those are good things to build on. Uh, my only thing going into offseason, I'm curious t- to how hot Coach Kim's seat is, is going in. Because at least to me, it felt very much like racing has all the pieces there. They have everything. They're just not fully executing. It kind of felt like playoff or bust for me this season. And like they were in it in <clears throat> the very last game. But they... They that, also like four games ago were in a better position than they are now and really like could not close it out. They they, they could have wrapped up a playoff position and, and missed opportunities. Um so that's where I'm curious. Yeah. There, with playoffs or bust, can Coach Kim argue is like, well, I nearly had us there. We're on the doorstep. Give me another season or whatever it is. Everybody was nearly there. Well, yeah, and, I mean, like Washington finished one place ahead of them, and and just fired their coach this morning. Yeah, Ooh. I'm. I, I, Which I, I would have thought, like, he has won the championship. I I would have thought, I would have thought, like, being a a previous championship winner coach would get you a little bit more of a leash than Mark Parsons had at Washington. But they, like, he got one season, and disappointing results. He was out. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's fair for for real serious questions to be asked about um the cam and stuff and you know i uh, i don't i don't think he's he's earned a lot of grace like we've seen what this roster like can do individually like we had how many players go to the uh, the world cup and yet that's we what, find ourselves that's in a what really six world cup all the players questions. all the players did so good in the world cup yeah, yeah there was a point in time where racing was like the highest scoring club at the world cup and even and like I think and like third or something top, like that is still they stayed up there. I think if you account assists, they were top two. If you like do the goals and assists yeah, thing, they were top assists. two as well. Because like I saw that, that I was like, okay, but that doesn't. Well, 
that was with several, like most of the players got knocked out early too. That, all of that was just based on early results. Cause they, the, didn't on, play as the only as one that made it past the quarterfinals is Chidiak and Chidiak rode really the played. bench of Australia. So yeah, I think that's the biggest, it does seem like the results were less than the sum of the parts this season. Um, so going into the offseason, I mean, the talent. positive on that is they already have a very good roster to build off of. I think this is not like previous off seasons they've had where they really have to make stuff happen. I think they can just sort of tweak around the edges with this roster. It, it, they do not need any big roster changes. So it really is yeah. just the the coaching question is the big, the big one. For well, this my question is, is it coaching or is it personnel? Cause they have all these big names. Sometimes Do even work to having, yeah. Does, are they truly working together? Yeah. So is it the case of they're just not working together or is it the case of coach Kim is not getting the best out of them? That's, I think that's where the, the leaders of the organization's examination, I'm sure there's a lot of factors and pieces of knowledge that they have that, that we don't have that will contribute to it. But from the outside looking in, like, I think it's incredibly fair to it, at, at least ask those questions and, and seriously mull over if, if, if he's the right choice or not. I personally think it's Coach Kim. There's subbing issues that he has and stuff like that where I'm like, you're it, even if it was a mix of, them not working the be- the players not working the best together you're not doing stuff that seems like to win you're keeping out players who you're keeping in players who aren't performing well when you should well, when you sub a player who's been maybe hot in a game the team was sort of like celebrating on twitter today so they they posted the like all of the iron women in the league uh and uh racing had three players that played every minute of the season and that is like very impressive for those three players i think that's also not it's probably not a great thing to have three that, players on your team that played every single minute of the season that i think that per, that says some like substitution problems to me personally there should never be a player even a keeper that should play every minute of a season I, now, I would say keeper is maybe the one. Like, if your keeper is healthy all year, your keeper should play the whole year. Yeah, Lund, Lund earned it. Lund, Lund definitely oh, yeah. earned that type of stuff. And I, it's like I think Malay has played every <laughs> minute since she's been here. <laughs> no, I think, that wouldn't yeah. surprise me. Yeah, um, it was just like it was specifically a midfielder with um, like what's her name? I'm lost on the name. Maybe she's not midfielder. Um. Uh, just the defense and defenders playing every minute is kind of rough, yeah. too. Well, and it was Ersic and Malay, where it was Ersic and Malay and uh Lund were the three. Ersic, and, yeah, and I think there were only like six players in the league that had also done that, and three were for Louisville. Uh, um, that's an issue. That, that that's, that's yeah. well, especially like Ersic is not a young player, so it, it's like that's it, what shocks she's me. someone that. you want to be you know, putting the miles on playing every single minute. And I was like, isn't Erks it like super experience and like in her thirties and she's playing every in her mid (laughs) thirties. She's playing every Mm. minute of a league season. Yeah. Um, so I I think that brings up, if not depth questions, definitely like substitution pattern questions. And well, and the, the Malay one is just the big hole in the roster last off season was at outside back. And they didn't really address it, and 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 had to had to go another season with basically no no depth at that position. Like when Pickett got injured, they they had no real <laughs> player to sub in there. They they kind of they sort of went into this season with like Malay and Carson Pickett have to play every minute, or else we don't really have another option. And so I think that's the big. That's the big off-season signing they need to make. Coaching stuff aside, is like they need outside back depth, really. I think back. it's just and... depth in general. Like I think attacking, we're pretty good, right? But I think midfield and defense they need a little bit more depth. Yeah. Yeah, because so we'll they. See. Yeah. We still have the expansion draft to to go through as well, so that's gonna 
I think that's going to add wrinkles to things. Yeah. I mean, potentially but they didn't even really, they didn't even sign everyone that they drafted last year. I, I don't, I don't know if it's if building through the expansion draft is something you can count on. No, I'm not saying building. I'm saying we, I mean, losing. Lose something. Oh, sorry. Could... Uh, blah. My, in my brain, I substituted college draft in there. Yeah. Sorry. No, I was afraid. I, yeah, that, that's yeah, not they also are going to lose somebody in the expansion draft. Well, yeah, they might have to be Carson two. Pickett. There's two expansion teams, right? Yeah, yeah, but just, they just I don't do think the they've draft. announced exactly how they're gonna. But don't both teams get picks? So technically, that would be like two players from each team get. Picked? I don't think you're necessarily guaranteed to to lose somebody. I forget how, how it goes, but I mean, like, there. I mean, the possibility <coughs> exists that we're going to maybe they, lose some they have people changed that we the way the draft to. works each time. So yeah. until until they announce it, we won't know for sure exactly how That's, it's going to be structured. Every every expansion draft is I mean, weird. Yeah. yeah, we can. I mean, we can obviously protect so many players, but uh, but inevitably, we're not going to be able to protect everybody that we'd otherwise like to. And so that, you know, all it takes is is one one selection there, and and it could be all. And they have your, all that weird money strategy. that they can trade, so they could like give up some funds and and skip having a player drafted. It, yeah, there's a lot. There are a lot of variables to play out there, so we'll see. Wait, what? <laughs> you could trade money to not get your players picked? Yeah, I missed it's that. A- no, uh, what just... allocation money? They have its what, allocation the money. Yeah, yeah the they MLS. do dumb stuff like the MLS. For... Oh, yeah. how, that's right. Like how DC United got Freddie Adu, even though they weren't the number one pick in the thing. The league literally went, "No, he needs to play in his hometown." So they gave whoever was supposed to be the number one pick. He's like, "You're and gonna MLS trade, and we're gonna like... give you money because you're giving up this like world class talent." <laughs> The MLS yeah. is the king of we all we have all these rules that say you can't do this unless we want a player to go to a specific place and then we'll just ignore all of them. Yeah, yeah. like the Columbus Miami thing or Columbus is like we just want one million dollars or like two million dollars <laughs> of wiggle room and the league was like no but Inter Miami you can have like forty million dollars of wiggle room. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's Miami. Who wouldn't want to come play for us? All right, I know. People before we wrap things out of the league. Or out of the into the playoffs. <laughs> hey, look, that wasn't funny. Now we was cool till then, John. Hold on, no, no shots. Now, before we wrap things up, Zach, I know there's a hot button issue that you wanted to address, and that is NWSL trophies. It. Boy, that supporter shield was bad, huh? But that's it's they're giving away a sixty dollar plate from Dick Sporting Goods for. For the league winners of the top tier women's league in the country. Yeah, that one's, I mean, it's pretty trash. But what did you think of the new of the new one they just showed today? Yes. So that's, I was going to go on a very long rant. Wait, I, before, wait. Every every time I looked at a picture of this dumb plate, I noticed another thing that, that annoyed me. It has CarMax written on it. They have a sponsor no, on the trophy. Hold on, I gotta look. Yeah, it, it does. It, it's on it's there. It's got a car. It's the. It's got Carmax engraved. Carmax couldn't uh, cough up more this than is, sixty bucks for the for the plate. This and is then also, plate. it annoys this me. This is a pie pan. It's a pie pan. It's, it's literally <laughs> like, like if you if you do well on a project at work, this is the thing they would give you as like your thank you that would sit on your desk and you would like never think of it again. Uh and also, like, a, a league shield should not be a thing that you make every year and give to the team. You should pony up the money up front and hire someone like Tiffany and company uh, to design a good one, and you make one of them, and then every time somebody wins it, you engrave their name on it, and then you pass it on to the next team each year. That's part of the reason that's these dinky little trophies is because they keep trying to make a new one and give it to the team each year. You make one and you do a good job on it and then you pass it from team to team every year and you get like actual history. Um, and... <laughs> yeah, it's like okay. a serving tray. <laughs> like I just saw the but yeah. no, the part yeah. the part that really sent me over the edge is when I noticed that Carmax was engraved on it. So forever. You got your trophy case in the stadium, and uh, we won the Carmax Supporter Shield that year. But the new ones do get your thumbs up. The new ones are very good because the new no. ones they did the right thing. Like they went, like T- Tiffany knows how to make good things. They went to an actual, like either designer or company who knows what they're doing, and they made a good trophy that doesn't look like it's made out of plastic. 
uh, <laughs> and doesn't look like they just cut it out of a, a piece of sheet metal <laughs> and get handed it to the team. Uh, yes, I am. I really like the new trophies. They they did a very good job on those. What do you think, Ben? I just don't have a super super strong opinion. Yeah, the the other ones were bad, but the it new is ones, hard like, to they, go they... wrong with like soccer ball with like spinny thing underneath I, it. That's I like that I like is that the go to like... soccer trophy, and it it works for a reason. <laughs> I appreciate when they then they're kind of like distinct. They have uh, have a kind of a look of their own, you know, and and it and it meets that criteria for me. It doesn't look cheap, so good enough for me. It is a lot the, better the than what was. The biggest thing I've noticed online is it seems like everyone has a very strong urge to try to spin the ball on the MVP. Oh trophy. yeah, if that thing's not movable, <laughs> they've messed up. <laughs> Tiffany and Company, I expect that. But no, like I a, really like interactive MVP. trophy. The MVP one to me is better than the the championship trophy, but I like them both. They're both a huge upgrade because the previous trophy was bad. (laughs) Yeah, personally, I prefer cup trophies if you're like the champion, but they're nice. They're very so you can drink out of it. Well, no, it's just like that's the soccer thing. It's like the more like it's a cup. Like MLS Mm -hmm. has its very weird one. Well, I think this one is clearly like trying to be in the vein of the world cup or the the world cup trophy because it's kind of a similar mm-hmm. design to that so mm-hmm. I, I think it I fits in sort of in that realm john you mentioned you like cups you mean like the league's cup trophy that inner miami one? Oh yeah that that's a great cup <laughs> you didn't even know there was a trophy for that i think my favorite my favorite is the stanley uh, cup because clearly like we were they I just love that you can you can see visually on the Stanley Cup how it it, it grew out of what it was intended for over time because it is this tiny little cup at the top that is the actual trophy and then they've added so many rows of plaques that it's now like ninety percent plaque and ten percent cup and it's it's glorious I love oh, it's Stanley like Cup. it's like four feet tall personally the <laughs> premise of the Stanley Cup is what I like is what you were talking about with the shield I like telling people you can't just like display your trophies you can put up banners but you can't display your trophies you want to display the trophy win it yeah you you don't own that cup you are renting it for a year if you win the championship which i you are a piece of the history it doesn't (coughs) end with you which i like win it and the funniest thing with the stanley cup is they try to make it so quick sometimes um there's like multiple typos on them (laughs) (laughs) i didn't know that uh, well, but... when it gets handed at at the end of the game, it doesn't have the winners on it. But there's just yeah. sometimes they'll get handed a sheet and they'll like yeah, grab the per- there. they'll grab someone's name like a letter wrong or something. And once you've like pounded that in, and because it's like a continuous ring that they'll have like four or five champions on, you can't just go like, oh, yeah. no race. <laughs> there's no race on metal. <laughs> no, it's uh... like permanent. I also really like so because when we were making fun of the the NWSL shield, I was I was looking up like what does the MLS shield look like? Because I I didn't actually know much about it. The MLS shield is actually pretty neat because uh, <laughs> the the league refused to do one. So in like 1999, oh, yeah. a bunch of the supporters got together, and uh, the reason it's called the supporter shield is because they did a fundraiser. And actually, like, pulled a bunch of money together with a bunch of supporters and commissioned the shield. And, and like, the supporters actually gave it to the the teams for the first couple of years. And it was not until, like, 2006 that the MLS even, like, officially started to recognize it. And that's, like, that's really cool. That's, like, a little bit of history. That, that is a neat thing. thing they've ever done. It, it, <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I mean, again, the league didn't do it. The supporters did, which is why it's cool. <laughs> the, the MLS would never... Do something cool like that on their own. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So yeah, they made if you look at the shield, that like logo in the middle, that that was the trophy they had. It was a similar looking trophy that looked like that. So it was a very plain thing. And then the MLS is like, I have to actually make an actual shield type thing. Yeah. They have the names engraved, like, yeah, that's that's how it should be. So anyway, I they did announce, they kind of pulled the rug out from it because they did it af- after they showed off the championship and the MVP trophy. They mentioned that Tiffany is also working on the shield for next year. So 
that that will be getting upgraded soon. I guess we can complain about that once we actually see it. More to come if on that one. Not made out of vibranium. I don't want it. <laughs> uh, right, ben, you got anything else? This is yeah, a good one. Say- this is a good show. This was a long show. Yeah, yeah, we, we we covered a lot of ground, hit a lot of topics from tsunami to uh, to shields. So <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming up, coming on, and thank no you problem. for helping me keep up with college soccer scores. Just posted two more while we were in here, so <laughs> make sure we check those out. Yeah, do you guys, do you guys keep plays. up the good work? Yeah, they use, college either plays like Thursday, some might play Friday, and then either Saturday afternoon or sunday afternoon that's when I'm or afraid. mondays john we've already had that conversation sometimes they're two okay mondays. two it was labor day and then one game was on a monday <laughs> that was Can't it escape. unless you're northern kentucky men's who have been going back and forth between conference and playing random tuesday games shout out to the north i never stops for you guys <laughs> nope <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys again so much for uh, for joining us, and thank you listeners for tuning in. Make sure you like, rate, subscribe, review, whatever else there is to do that positively impacts us. I don't know. We will catch you guys next week. Hopefully, we'll be talking about um, a little city playoff win. Not super optimistic, but maybe well, we'll find out. I'm optimistic. There we go. I like your. I like they your spirit, John. Nervous. Yeah, I mean, we'll that's see. a winnable first round game. So. I'm gonna stay silent. All right. Yeah, you We're don't want go. him predicting the score. He is a curse. All right. I'm going to let these <laughs> listeners go. You guys take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye, all.